Hi everybody, welcome back. And if you're new, welcome. My name is Gabby. And if you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do, I cover true crime cases. And all the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click the subscribe button, and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. For our third case of No Trace November, which is a series every November here on my channel where I strictly cover missing persons cases, I'm covering a case that doesn't have a lot of information regarding it, but of course those are the cases, as many of you already know, that I mostly lean towards covering. Today's video is in collaboration with someone who is always a pleasure to work with, and that is Michelle Short. You can find her write-ups on Hub Pages. I will have her information linked below for all of you to check out, which I highly recommend because she posts a lot of cases that I have never heard of myself, including the one that we are covering today. I don't think if she had not covered it, I would have ever come across it. With all of that being said, let's get right into it. This is the unsolved disappearance of Stephen Milan. Born October 19th of 1977, Stephen Vincent Milan resided with his family in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. A business major, he studied at Humber College in Toronto. However, like I stated before, details surrounding his life and enigmatic vanishing are scarce. Humber College was conveniently situated near his residence, making it the perfect choice for his studies. During the early months of 1998, Stephen expressed his desire to his parents to travel to the United States. Why is that? Well, he had heard about a new product available there to treat hair loss that had been recently approved for distribution and could be purchased over the counter. Stephen saw this as an opportunity to improve his appearance and boost his confidence. Friday, February 13th of 1998 was like any other day. But going into the 14th, a little after midnight, Stephen departed from his home in the 1200 block of Scottsburg Crescent. The strange thing is he did not tell his parents where he was heading. American customs officials were able to confirm that Stephen's black 1991 two-door Chevrolet Beretta crossed into the United States via the Rainbow Bridge in Niagara Falls, New York on Valentine's Day, February 14th of 1998. The Niagara Falls International Rainbow Bridge, most commonly known as the Rainbow Bridge, is a steel arch bridge across the Niagara River connecting the cities of Niagara Falls, New York and Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. We know that this is where Stephen's car entered the United States, but it remains a mystery whether he was the one behind the wheel or not. Was he the one actually driving the car? We don't know that. After that, his whereabouts are completely unknown, but several days later, his car was found in a parking lot all the way across the country at Arizona's Little Colorado River Gorge Overlook. The Beretta seemed to have been abandoned. The odd thing is that the keys were still in the ignition. The location where the car was supposedly found was close to Navajo jewelry sellers. A Native American man who was selling items there allegedly took the car, thinking nobody would come to claim it since it had been left unattended for some time. He drove the vehicle until it stopped working. Then he sold off some parts and left it parked near a Grand Canyon lookout point not far from where he first found it. It was at this spot that authorities discovered the Beretta on June 8th of 1998. Authorities would search this area and search the area where the man had found the car abandoned originally and no traces of Stephen were found. I do need to mention that the location of Stephen's home and the location of where his car was located days later by the man in Arizona is roughly 2,100 miles apart or approximately a 30 hour drive. Yes, his car was found by the man days later, but this man didn't know this car belonged to a missing man. Stephen's car wasn't officially taken in by Peel Regional Police until four months after his disappearance. When authorities in Arizona located his car, it was missing its license plate, so authorities had to run its vehicle number, and this is when they discovered that the car belonged to Stephen Milan, a missing man from Canada. So for that entire four months, his parents had no idea where their son was. They had no clue that his car was all the way in Arizona. Stephen's parents were questioned by authorities. They said it was highly uncharacteristic for him to leave home without an explanation. So it wasn't in his nature to leave home without letting his parents know where he was going, what he was doing, and when he'd be back. If it really was Stephen who drove the car into the United States on February 14th, their only guess as to why he would have possibly wanted to do this was to obtain the hair growth product. 
Why he would have traveled all the way to Arizona though to buy this product is completely unknown if it was a product you could have purchased anywhere in the United States over the counter. It just doesn't make sense even all these years later why he would have entered into the US and then traveled all the way to the other side of the country. It makes you think though, did he possibly drive into New York and while he was in New York, he was met with foul play and the person responsible stole his vehicle and drove it cross country, ultimately ditching it over 2000 miles away? This is a theory in this case, but it's a theory that doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, it doesn't seem like Steven had any friends or at least any known friends to his parents or any family that lived in Arizona. No one that he would have made the drive for. Investigators did at one point in this case speculate that Steven's disappearance may have been linked to another young Canadian man who remains unnamed. There was speculation that these two individuals may have been acquainted and vanished together. Several years later though, the other man was tragically discovered deceased around three hours away from the Little Colorado River Gorge Overlook. Both individuals were remarked as having complicated personal lives. However, no further details have ever been provided when it comes to that statement. When it comes to the complicated personal lives of these two men, we don't know if that's referring to their home life, their life with their family, or their life at school with their friends, or possibly it's referring to some sort of relationship issues. This has never been discussed any further, but when it comes to Stephen in particular, I have read that he did have a close-knit family. So I'm not entirely sure if these complications in his life had to do with his family per se. Despite the similarity in circumstances, law enforcement ultimately dismissed this theory that these two were connected as there was no concrete evidence to establish a connection between the two. When it comes to Stephen possibly having a complicated personal life, this makes a lot of people back then and today consider that maybe he was struggling with depression. This is what started the theory of could he have been depressed and decided to drive to a place like the Grand Canyon to end his life? There is no solid proof to back this tragic theory up, but it's one that many have considered. Joe Sumner, a volunteer for the Coconino County Cold Case Unit, stated, they did an extensive search. It's unknown what happened, so we don't know where Mr. Milan is. We know where his car wound up. We know he wasn't found in Little Colorado Gorge, and he hasn't contacted his family. In the year of 2012, officials collected DNA samples from Stevens' relatives to compare with unidentified remains found in Coconino County, Arizona. Unfortunately, it was not a match. The samples were also entered into a database specifically for matching missing individuals to unidentified remains, but so far, no matches have been made. Although there is little information regarding this case, a massive search was conducted from Southern Canada to the Southern United States. Joe Sumner stated that Stephen could have simply walked away from his car, never returning to it. His disappearance could have been the result of foul play and he could have been thrown in the gorge and has never been found. Or he could have even been met with foul play in Canada and the person drove his car into the United States, drove it Southwest to Arizona. We really don't know. Stephen Vincent Milan was 20 years old at the time of his disappearance. Today, he would be 47. In 1998, he stood at five feet, 10 inches tall, and weighed roughly 150 pounds. He had dark brunette hair and brown eyes. He was last seen wearing a black velvet V-neck sweater, a black waist length coat with a sheep fleece collar and lining, a brown corduroy hat, and carrying a black canvas backpack. He had on him a gold chain with a small watch pendant. He has a two to three inch oval shaped birthmark under his right arm. If you have any information regarding Stephen's disappearance, you are urged to contact the Peel Regional Police at 905-453-2121. One. Stephen, though, is classified as an endangered missing, meaning investigators are more so leaning towards his disappearance being the result of foul play. When or where that took place is completely unknown. Many of us are familiar with the website, The Charlie Project, that highlights missing persons cases out of the United States. Stephen went missing from Canada and Canadian authorities are overseeing his case, but he is listed on the site due to the fact his car was located here in the United States. And 
and he possibly was the one to drive it over the border. This case is 26 years old, and today, like so many other cases, we are nowhere closer to knowing exactly what happened than we are at the very beginning of his disappearance. There are very few that believe Stephen possibly left his old life behind and started anew here in the United States. We do have to take into consideration that it doesn't seem like there were any supposed sightings of Stephen anywhere here in the United States. I also was extremely curious if anyone had spotted Stephen along the way from Canada to Arizona, but I couldn't find that information. It doesn't seem like anyone did come forward claiming they saw him at a gas station or grabbing food, but I can't say for certain. If anyone had, I am sure that that would have been highlighted somewhere online. Now, this case has been posted on Reddit, specifically on the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. Reddit does bring forth some crazy theories, but it also does bring forth some solid theories. It's never been stated publicly what hair loss product Stephen may have wanted to buy in the US, if that even is the reason he crossed the border, but one Reddit user commented that it may have been Propecia. I looked into Propecia and it was approved by the FDA for male hair loss here in the United States the year prior to his disappearance in 1997. Another Reddit user commented, from Niagara Falls to the Grand Canyon, this bothers me a lot. I mean, you could think that someone stole his car from him, but the idea of someone driving a stolen car from freaking Ontario to the Grand Canyon is a bit far-fetched. A trip that distance suggests more that he drove it there. I mean, most of the time when a car is stolen, it tends to be sold for scraps in a small amount of time after it was stolen. It's not driven across a whole continent. I do have to say that for the most part, I agree with this comment. It's just a bit hard for me to believe that someone stole the car in Canada or New York and drove it all the way to Arizona. I also saw some people say that this was 1998, possibly he met someone in a chat room and wanted to make the drive to meet them. If you're going to be making a trip like this and meeting an internet friend, chances are you're going to pack. I didn't see it anywhere that he had actually packed any belongings. He just left with the clothes on his back. This is definitely an interesting theory. It is something to think about, but I don't know how much I believe it, but mostly just based on the fact that he didn't pack anything. A lot of people have pointed out that one of the strangest aspects of this case is the fact that his car keys were left in the car's ignition. Almost like he got out of the car real quick to do something and had the intentions of coming right back to it. Then on the other hand, maybe he left them in the car because he had no intentions of coming back to it. The man who found his car does seem to be a bit suspicious to people who look into this case, but it seems like authorities felt there was no need to consider this man a person of interest in this case. According to thetravel.com, the Grand Canyon, while breathtaking, is one of the most dangerous national parks in the United States as of 2024. While precise figures can be elusive, estimates suggest that well over 1,100 people have gone missing within the Grand Canyon's boundaries. Besides that, there have been 165 recorded deaths between 2007 and 2023, the most fatalities any national park has seen. Overall, on average, Grand Canyon National Park claims the life of a visitor almost every month. Thankfully, more than 250 people are rescued from the Grand Canyon each year, but there are a lot of people who do go hiking at the Grand Canyon and just never make it back. Also, where Stephen's car was allegedly originally found by the man was right near the Little Colorado River. Unfortunately, there's just so much land and so many places for a person to go missing in this area, especially if there is a possibility that they wanted to. So that is all of the information that I have for you today when it comes to Stephen Milan's case. I really tried to find everything I could, but that was basically it. Sometimes when it comes to researching, if you are in a different country, you might not be able to find a lot of information when it comes to a case, but I have covered cases from Canada before and found tons of information. This one, this was it. I wanna thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your day to hear about Steven's case though, and definitely let me know your theories down below in the comments because I'm really eager to see what everyone has to say. But like with any case that I cover, you never know who may stumble across this video, so make sure to leave some kind words down below in the comments as well for Steven's loved ones. I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day wherever you are. Stay safe, and I hope to see you in the next one.